This is Ambassador Publications Confirmation Lesson 8, The Sixth Commandment and Faithfulness. Let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have called us into fellowship with yourself, but that you have also given us each other for fellowship, and that you have created the special institution, the special relationship that we call marriage. We thank you that you have given us guidelines for how to live in this unique and special relationship. And we pray now that as we look at your word, that you will help us to understand and live according to your will for us. We ask in your precious name. Amen. Dr. Martin Luther, in his large catechism, uh, commenting on the sixth commandment, wrote this. Inasmuch as this commandment is concerned specifically with the estate of marriage and gives occasion to speak of it, let us carefully note, first, how highly God honors and glorifies the married life, sanctioning and protecting it by his commandment. So we're going to look at this commandment. We'll look at the commandment itself from Scripture. We'll look at Dr. Martin Luther's explanation to it in the small catechism. And then we'll look at the principles for marriage that we find in the Bible that help us be obedient to this commandment. So our thesis for this lesson is that God honors and glorifies marriage. And so then we want to know uh, what is God's plan for marriage and how can we be a part of that plan. If you haven't read Genesis chapter 39 verses 1 to 23. I'll suggest that you can pause the video at this point and read that part of, of Scripture, the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, or uh, read it at the end of the lesson. But uh, in any case, um, it'd be a good idea to read that uh, story so that um, we have a, the background for how we're looking at this lesson. And then I'm going to read for us the introductory paragraphs that uh, show us how the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife introduces us to the biblical concepts of marriage. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she said, lie with me. What's a young man to do? We have no idea what Potiphar's wife looked like but all the paintings and movies make her out to be a stunning beauty, a desirable woman. We do know that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and we do know that Potiphar's wife wanted him. She wanted to have sex with him, and she was not shy about letting him know it. Not just once did she invite him to bed, but she did so day after day. Eventually, she even grabbed him to take him there. What is a young man to do? We have no way of knowing exactly what would have happened if Joseph had given in to the temptations to have sex outside of marriage. We know that giving in to sexual temptation is sin, and we know God hates sin. We also know the story would not have turned out the way it did if Joseph had committed adultery. Even so, we might be surprised at how the story turned out, at first anyway. One of the things we can learn from Joseph is that we should do what God wants us to do simply because it is right. Being rewarded should not be our motivation. Joseph resisted the temptation to have sex with his master's wife. As a result, Joseph ended up in jail. He did not end up in jail because he resisted temptation. He ended up in jail because Potiphar's wife lied about him and her husband believed the lie. But he ended up in jail with a clean conscience. In any case, Joseph paid dearly for being obedient to God. He went to jail and he spent over two years there. Even though God blessed him in jail and gave him great authority there, jail was a terrible place to be. No matter how much Joseph may have thought it, 
God had not forgotten him. In fact, God used some very exceptional circumstances to free Joseph from the pit. Joseph was given a, the second highest place in Egypt, in command only under the Pharaoh himself. We can also learn from Joseph that it is possible for us to resist sexual temptation. There is no question that there are many sexual temptations in our lives. Young ladies, it is the way of boys to want to be sexually active with you. Young men, the girls today are more and more bold, and you may have experiences much like Joseph did. Sex is everywhere we look, in advertising, in the movies, on TV, at school. Pornography is easy to find. There is no question we will be tempted. To protect us from the terrible damage sexual sin can cause in our lives and to help us see God's intent for sex, God has given us the sixth commandment. So we're going to open our Bibles and go to Exodus chapter 20, and this time it's verse 14, and we have the space in our worksheets to write down the commandment. The commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. So here's how Dr. Martin Luther explained that commandment when he wrote about it in his catechism. And again, you want to find that in your catechism and copy the meaning for the commandment into your worksheet. And I'll read it for us here. And then if you haven't done this already uh, or uh, probably won't have time while we're going through the lesson to do it, but you want to make sure that you have those uh, words written down in your catechism and think about them as you are copying them into your, into your worksheets. So this is what Dr. Martin Luther wrote. He said, We should fear and love God so that we lead a chaste and pure life in word and deed, and that husband and wife love and honor each other. There's a couple of words here that we want to pay attention to. Uh, notice that we're starting the explanation again with our fellowship with God, right? That we fear and love God. So our obedience to the commandments doesn't gain us anything with God. We don't obey the commandments so that God will love us. We don't obey the commandments so that God will receive us into fellowship. We obey the commandments because if we have had our sins forgiven, if we have been born again, and we believe that that happens to us in baptism, and we'll cover that really at the end of our two years of classes. Um, when we get to the, the end of the second year of studies, we'll, we'll see how uh, the Bible talks about baptism. But just for now, we believe that when we are baptized, our old nature is put to death, and a new nature is born in its place. And so we call that being born again. Uh, Maybe we've walked away from our baptism, or maybe we haven't been baptized, and we, and we ought to be. But if we've walked away from our baptism, then through repentance, God brings us back into the fellowship uh, of our birth, of our rebirth. And so when that happens, then the new person wants to do what's right. It wants to fear and love God. And so then it does obey the commandments uh, or, or wants to obey the commandments. And we're not always good at it. Um, and sometimes we do sin, and hopefully, uh, though we are remembering every day what Jesus has done for us, repenting of our sins and receiving his forgiveness, so that we leave a, lead a chaste and pure life. So the word chaste, um, it, it means that we're not doing things that are sexually immoral, that we're not doing things that are against God's plan for our human sexuality. Uh, so chaste and pure. Uh, and, and we recognize that uh, the husband and wife relationship is a good relationship and that husbands and wives need to love each other and honor each other in that relationship. So we're going to notice as we uh, look at Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther's uh, explanation of the commandment that it's a positive one. There isn't a list of do nots in this explanation like there is in some of the other explanations. 
Dr. Martin Luther understood that the best way to understand this commandment is to have a proper understanding of marriage. And so we're going to look at five biblical principles of marriage. And I think if we can apply these five principles to our marriages, then that's going to help us and motivate us to live a chaste and pure life. So the first of our five principles is that marriage is the union of one man and one woman, each created in the image of God. So there's a lot of things in there. One man, one woman, created in the image of God. So we're going to look at some uh, Bible verses to help us understand this principle. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So I'll let you uh, find Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 in your Bible. Uh, and um, we're just asked to read that, and then there's some questions that we're going to answer as we read that verse. The verse reads, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So this is the first foundation that we build our human relationships on, that we are created in God's image, that we are male and female created in God's image. So in whose image are we created? That's the question that we're asked. And the answer, we're created in the image of God. And then in what two forms are we created? And the answer for that is that we are created male and female. So then uh, in our lesson, we have this statement about um, being created in God's image. When God made us, he shared three of his character traits with us. This is what it means to be created in his image. So we're going to read some verses now and answer questions to discover what these three traits are. Uh, again, later in our confirmation studies, when we study the Apostles' Creed and, and the first article of the Apostles' Creed that says that we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we're going to look at 12 attributes of God, 12 character traits. And three of those he shares with us in creation. So the first place that we're going to go to, to find out which of these three are is Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, this is what we read. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So the question that we're asking then is, what did God conclude about his creation? And as we read the creation account, we, saw, we see that God said that his creation was very good. So here's the question then. If this is true, that is, if it's true that God's creation is very good, what might we say about the presence of sin in the original creation? Right? If creation is very good, then I think that we can gather from that that there was no sin. Right? This implies that there is no sin or that there was no sin in the original creation. His creatures, that is the man and the woman, were completely, fully holy. They had no sin. If, if they had sin at this point in the creation story, then God would not have said that creation was very good because we can't have very good if there is sin. So uh, we believe then that because God said that his creation was very good, that his original creation had no sin. There was no sin. Adam and Eve did not have sin. Then we're going to read Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. 
The question that we have is, what would happen to Adam and Eve if they ate of the tree, or from the, tr the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? So when we look back again at Genesis 2, 16 and 17, we see exactly what God told them. Right? The penalty for eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, eating the fruit from that tree, was death. So God told them that they would die if they ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if it's true that Adam and Eve would die, what might we say about death before sin? So the implication here is that there was no death before sin came into the world. If Adam and Eve were going to die by eating the fruit, that means that they, would, that they would not die if they did not eat the fruit. And if they did not die, then there was no death. So before they sinned, they were immortal. That's the word that we use for saying that they would not die. Mortal means that we die. We are mortal. Simply, that means that we die, that we will die. Immortal says that we do not die. And so we conclude that because Adam and Eve had no sin, they were immortal. So let's look again at Genesis 2, 6 and 16 and 17. Again, let's read it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So what choice did God give Adam and Eve? God added a consequence to eating fruit. And so that implies that the man and the woman had a choice to eat or not to eat. So what might we say about having the will to choose before sin came into the world. Right, so the first thing we saw was that God shared his eternal nature with us. God doesn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an end. We as humans had a beginning. But if sin hadn't come into the world, there would be no end. There would be no death. So uh, God shared immortality with us and then we became mortal when sin came into the world. The second thing here we're seeing is that, that there's something about choosing, right? So if God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree, he was giving them a choice. He gave them consequences for eating, but they had a choice. So before sin came into the world, we all had a will which allowed us to choose to disobey. When sin came, we lost that will because uh, we became bound to sin. We became slaves of sin, and so then we have to sin. So we don't have a choice about it anymore, but Adam, Adam and Eve had a choice. Okay, so that's why we are all born sinners separated from God, because we've inherited uh, the disobedience of Adam and Eve. We're bound to sin. We're slaves of sin. We're dead in our trespasses and sin as Paul tells the Ephesian Christians in the letter to the Ephesians, you can look that up at the beginning of chapter 2. Only the blood sacrifice of Jesus, which, uh, would, through which God forgives us, can free us from our bondage to sin uh, so, that we, so that we are in Christ instead of in sin. So, two things then, right? The question says, did you discover that God made us holy and immortal and with a will. So I'm sorry, I need to back up there. I said, I said immortality was the first thing. Actually, holiness is the first thing, right? So we noticed uh, that when God said that everything is very good, that there was no sin, so God shared his holiness with us. The second thing we notice is that before sin came into the world, Adam and Eve were not going to die, that they were immortal until they sinned. And so God shared immortality with us. He shared, we might say, half of his eternal nature. He, didn't, he, he gave us a beginning, but we would have had no end. Uh, and then spiritually, we still don't. But uh, the difference is that 
God's original intention was that we would be in fellowship with him for eternity. Uh, when sin came in, that changed. And then the third thing is that he shared his will with us, that God chose to make us, and then God gave us a decision about sinning, and Adam and Eve sinned. And ever since then, all of us have to, have to we could say, we're slaves to sin, so it's the only thing we can do is, is sin. Uh, and we are born dead in our trespasses and sin. So God gave us these three traits when he made us in his image. Okay, so we, so we were made holy, we were made immortal, and we were made with a will, the choice. Uh, we've lost all three of those. So um, then let's look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 21 and 22, uh, to see the second part of our first principle, right? The, the first principle said that, that marriage is between one man and one woman created in the image of God. So we looked at how we're created in the image of God, and now we'll look at the rest of that statement. So Genesis 2, 21 and 22 says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So we're going to ask the question, what gift did God give Adam? And so we see that God declared that it was not good for him to be alone. And so God brought him a woman. And then Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So what, are, what is God's plan then for this special man-woman relationship? And, and we see that there are two things here in this plan. Uh, actually, three things in this plan that, that happen. Um, that first of all, the man is to leave his family. So he is no longer uh, with mom and dad or listening to mom and dad. We still have to honor our parents. Uh, even after we get married, we still honor our parents, but we no longer depend on them. Uh, and now we have our own family. And so uh, we're joined. The man and his wife are joined. It says the man is joined to his wife. Uh, there are some, depending on what translation you're using there, uh, you might have the word cleave or cling, a uh, number of different ways that we translate the Hebrew word there, but it means to be joined. And then the result of that is that the man and the woman become one flesh. So three, three pieces of the plan here for this special relationship, that the man leaves his family, that the man is joined to his wife, and we're going to notice here that it's singular. Man is singular and wife is singular. So it's one man being joined to one woman. That's God's original plan for us. That doesn't mean that we in all of, all of history have been obedient to that plan. Uh, and if you are being a, a part of our Sunday morning Bible study, uh, you'll notice that um, e the people that, that God used to come to us uh, had more than one wife. Uh, we're looking at Jacob right now and we're finding that he actually had four wives. Um, that, that wasn't God's original plan for us. God's original plan for us is a man leaving his family and being joined to his wife and the two of them becoming one flesh. The second purpose for marriage that we find in Scripture is that Marriage is to share in creation, to fill the earth with the image of God. Now, the, the reason we talked about the image of God first and then the joining of the husband and his wife into one flesh is because then God uses that joining of the husband and his wife to create more people, right? And if we're created in God's image, then our children are also created in God's image. And so we're saying that th this is the first reason and purpose for marriage, that we share in creation and that we fill the earth with the image of God. So we're going to find that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and we read, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So this is the very first commandment that God gave to humanity. This is, uh, you know, and when, we, when we're reading Genesis 1 and 2, we're seeing that Genesis chapter 1 in the first part of chapter 2 is the account of the six days of creation and the seventh day when God rested. And then the rest of chapter 2 is, it's like focusing in just on the sixth day and the creation of the man and the woman. Because then God tells us in detail what he did to make the man and the woman and how he put them in the garden and that there were some uh, commands that he gave to them then. But when we read the Bible, the very first command that we find that is given to the man and the woman is this one in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. So our question then is, what is the first command that God gave the man and the woman? And as we look back at that verse, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 28, it, we see that the first command is actually a double command. It's to be fruitful and to multiply. And so God's intent, God's first purpose for marriage is children. And so the marriage relationship, uh, the only relationship that we can biblically, according to the Bible, call marriage is a man and a woman because that's the way biologically, the only way biologically, uh, without the help of surrogates or without the help of uh, you know, other scientific things, um, we call it in vitro fertilization, where the woman's uh, ovum and the man's sperm are put together in a little dish in a lab. Uh, so that's different. This is natural. The way that God in naturally intends for us to have children requires a man and a woman. And so in order for us to fulfill this part of marriage, right, we're recognizing uh, that he is commanding us to be fruitful and multiply, that it's the man and the woman joining together, and that's their first purpose in marriage. Okay, we're ready then for the third purpose, the third biblical uh, principle about marriage, is that marriage is a unique relationship in which a man and a woman become one for life. And, and again, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Right. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So what two things should the man do? Right, we saw this before in the principle, but here again we're seeing it, that he's to leave his family and that he is to be joined or to hold fast to his wife. Right, so this is coming together uh, in this uh, union uh, where they become one, but that the man is to be joined to his wife. He's to hold fast to her. He's to keep her close to his heart. Um, the result of this union is that the two become one. And we don't, uh, we don't completely understand how that actually is, but we do recognize that the union between a husband and a wife, uh, and, and it, it's not just sexual, but it is also sexual, uh, is a very powerful union. And that uh, in, in some way that, that's in the way that God made us, there is a, a joining together of these two people, this man and this woman, so that the Bible says that they are actually one. And then Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, we're going to see Jesus commenting on this very commandment. Or very, um, well, I guess we can call it a commandment. It's God telling the man to leave his family and be joined to his wife, to hold fast to his wife. Let's see what Jesus has to say about that. So Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, And he answered and said, so that's Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning 
made them male and female. So there Jesus is affirming the image of God creation and that in the image of God we are a man and a woman. He made them female, male and female. And so he's talking here about marriage as a relationship between a man and a woman, a male and a female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then he quotes, right? He quoted Genesis Chapter 2, verse 24, and then he makes this comment. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. So Jesus is affirming that the two become one. And then he tells us this. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So the, the principle here that we are looking at is that this unique relationship that God creates where the two become one, is intended in God's original creation to be a lifelong relationship. God wants us to stay married to the one person that we married for all of our life. That is his original intent uh, as he gives us the principles for marriage. The fourth principle for marriage then uh, Oh, let me, oops, I'm jumping ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, the question that we ask, what is our responsibility in marriage? Um, again, what did Jesus say? What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So uh, if we are going to be fully obedient to this commandment, then we want to uphold this principle of marriage as well. And then the fourth principle of marriage is that marriage is the only relationship which God allows and in which God allows and celebrates sexual intercourse. Okay, so let's read that again. Marriage is the only relationship in which God allows and celebrates sexual intercourse. So we're going to go back and look at the commandment again, right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, he says, you shall not commit adultery. So what is the sexual behavior that God condemns? Okay, in the sixth commandment, God specifically condemns adultery. But we understand the commandment to include any and all sexual intercourse outside of marriage of one man and one woman. So how do we define what adultery is? So most specifically, adultery is if a man or a woman has sexual intercourse with somebody they're not married to. Right? So if a man has sexual intercourse with a woman that he's not married to, that's adultery. If a woman has sexual intercourse with a man that, he's, that she's not married to, that's adultery. If anybody has sexual intercourse with somebody they're not married to, that is adultery. But we also understand that sex before marriage is also, sexual intercourse before marriage is also a part of this commandment. And that if we are to lead chaste and pure lives, then we celebrate sexuality, but within marriage between a man and a woman, right? So uh, that's what the commandment means when it says you shall not commit adultery. If we are going to live chaste and pure lives, then we are going to reserve and celebrate sex within the marriage relationship and only within the marriage relationship. A marriage meaning a man and a woman. And then uh, we also notice in, in our uh, statement about the principle of marriage that God celebrates the sexual union. Not only does he allow it, but he celebrates it. And so there's a, a number of places we can go, but we're going to go uh, to Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 where we read, right, and he's, uh, this is Solomon talking to his boys, um, and we recognize that Solomon was not particularly good about obeying the commandment. Uh, he was not at all good about obeying the commandment, and, and he had to repent. And I think at the end of his life, he did repent of, of what he had done, uh, and he encouraged his, his boys uh, and the men uh, that he was king over uh, with these words. He said, let your foundation be blessed, and rejoice in the wife of your youth, as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times, 
be exhilarated always with her love. And so certainly this is uh, encouraging men to love their wives and to uh, celebrate together the sexual union. And then we also, or the question that we're asking is what is the proper place for a sexual relationship? Again, a couple things that, that um, Solomon is saying there in, in Proverbs chapter 9, uh, that, that the sexual union is to be celebrated, that's one, but also that it is with the wife, the husband with the wife. So as he's talking to his boys, he's saying, rejoice in the wife of your youth. So it's always within marriage. So what is the proper place for sexual relationship? Solomon tells his son to delight himself in, this, in his relationship with his wife and only with his wife. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, we read, Marriage is to be held in honor among all. The marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So now we, we're introducing a new word here. But first, um, as we summarize this verse, which is what we're asked to do in our lesson, summarize Hebrews 13.4, marriage is to be held in honor, right? And the marriage bed is to be kept pure. So the marriage bed, uh, the word there is uh, koite, which uh, is our English word coitus, which is kind of the, the medical term for sexual intercourse. Uh, so that it's speaking very specifically here. You know, we've translated it marriage bed, but it's very specifically talking about the sexual union between a man and his wife, that that is to be kept pure. And then we have this new word, fornicators. It says, for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And this is one of the verses that we use to understand the commandment itself, where it says, you shall not commit adultery, to include premarital sex between people that aren't married at all, right? So for, for adultery, specifically and narrowly defined, is a married person having sex with somebody they're not married to, that he or she is not married to. Fornication is technically sexual relationships before any either of the parties are married uh, at all. And so here we find that both of those are wrong. And so sex before marriage, sex is good and sex is to be celebrated. And if a married couple is having trouble with their sexuality, then it's important for them to find some help, to talk to a marriage counselor who can help them work through some of those issues so that we honor marriage in the way that the Bible has encouraged us to honor marriage. But we also want to make sure that we understand that we are to save and reserve ourselves for after marriage. That having sexual intercourse is something that God wants us to have, but only within a man and woman marriage. And then we're going to look at the fifth of our principles for marriage. Marriage is a metaphor of God's relationship to the church. So as we look at these five principles, these are ways that we can be encouraged for having healthy marriages. And one of the reasons that we should really work hard, and marriage is, marriage is a lot of work. We are very selfish people, you know, and we've talked about selfishness, uh, and we'll continue to talk about selfishness because selfishness is really why we break the commandments because we're selfish because we don't want to do what God wants us to do. We want to do things our own way. And the same is true in our relationships. And it's very true in marriage that we so often act selfishly and pridefully. And when we do that, it hurts our marriage relationship. And it takes a lot of work not to be selfish. Uh, and so marriage is a lot of work. Um, and so having these Bible principles, hopefully, is an encouragement to us about doing the work that's needed to have healthy marriages. Uh, and so this, the last of these principles, uh, the reason that we as Christians want to have healthy marriages is because the world looks at our marriages and sees there 
the metaphor sees there uh, the metaphor that God has for us about marriage. Now, I, I, at the same time as I'm saying this, I don't, I don't mean this to be a burden on us. And yet, the way we live our lives out is a witness. You know, if we've been born again, we belong to Jesus, the way we live our lives is a witness to the world. Right? We do good works so that the people around us will give glory to our Father who is in heaven. And having healthy marriages is a way of doing good works, not to earn something from God, but to be a good witness to what God has done in our lives. And so let's look then at this principle about how marriage is a metaphor for God's relationship with his church. So we're going to start in Isaiah, and there's a lot of places in the Old Testament where we can look at this, but this is one of them. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, which reads, For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord, and notice it's all capital, L-O-R-D, the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. So Isaiah here is talking to the people of Israel, specifically God's people, the people that God created, the nation that God created, and he is telling them that their maker, Yahweh of hosts, the Holy One of Israel, the God of all the earth, is their husband. And so he's putting this into a marriage relationship, that the people of Israel are the bride, the wife, and that God is the husband. Uh, and, and so the question is, what metaphor is, is used for God's relationship with his people? And it's the metaphor of marriage. God called himself the husband of his people, so God uses marriage as a metaphor of his relationship to his people. And then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32 brings this into the New Testament, and it talks about Christ and the church. So God and the people of Israel is paralleled with Christ and the church, and, and um, Paul is quoting uh, Genesis here and then applying it. He says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Right? He's quoting Genesis chapter 2. And then here's what he concludes about that. He says, This mystery is great. So it's a mystery on, on more than one level. The fact that a man and a woman, uh, when they have sexual intercourse, become one, is mystery. And then he applies this to us as the church, and he says, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And so he understands that here Christ is the man and the church is the wife, and that when they come together, they become one also. So according to verse 32, what does the man and the wife union refer? To what does the man and wife union refer? Paul calls the man-woman one flesh union a great mystery and then refers it to the union between Christ and the church. Well, We've made it through the five principles for marriage that the Bible tells us about. I want to encourage us as we look at these principles to remember that we all do battle with sin. That we ought not to deliberately sin. When we deliberately sin or deliberately continue to live in sin, we are placing ourselves back into bondage, back into slavery to sin. And the result of that is death, spiritual death, separation again from God. But we have a God who is a loving and forgiving God. And so we need to also remember that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is just or righteous and he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That doesn't give us an excuse to deliberately sin, but it does mean that if we have sinned, we need to repent of our sin and receive forgiveness that he gives to us. So then I'm going to ask us to do a C123 
paragraph. Remember, C is a statement. Once a one-sentence statement, a two-sentence example, and a three-sentence explanation. And the two-sentence example, you know, even when I was teaching this in middle school English, I was a little bit flexible with that because, you know, particularly now, maybe our Bible verse that we're quoting isn't two sentences. But that's kind of our general guideline when we write a C123 paragraph. But here's the question that I would like us to wrestle with and just ask, what is one biblical truth about marriage, right? So there are five that we could write about. Um, if we go back through our lesson, we're noticing again that um, the first principle is that marriage is the union of one man and one woman, each created in the image of God. So we could answer that as our statement and then use a Bible verse uh, to back that up and then explain that. Our second principle is that the purpose of marriage is to share in creation and fill the earth with God's image. And then we could use Genesis 128 as our example and then write three sentences about that. Our third principle is that marriage is a unique relationship in which a man and a woman become one for life. And we could use Genesis 2, 24 and 25, or we could use Matthew 19, uh, particularly verse 6, I, I would say, as our, our example, and then three sentences to explain that. Marriage is the only relationship in which God allows and celebrates sexual intercourse. We could write about that. Uh, or marriage is a metaphor of God's relationship to the church. So uh, that's the one that I'm going to choose for my paragraph. And let me just uh, read my paragraph and I'll, and I'll uh, show it to you here too. So marriage is a metaphor of the relationship that Christ has with the church. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. When Paul quoted Genesis 2, 24, he said it was a mystery. We can believe that a man and a woman joined in marriage become one flesh. We can also understand that in addition to God describing marriage, he is giving us a living picture of the relationship Jesus wants to have with his church, a relationship of perfect union. If you have any questions about the lesson, uh, my contact information will be in the description. I am marking this video as a video for children. Uh, which means that the comments are turned off. Uh, but if you have a question or want to make a comment uh, about the lesson, uh, you can use the email or the contact uh, page on my personal website, or you can email from the church website, and I'll have uh, both of those linked in the description to this video. And then uh, I look forward to being able to meet with you face-to-face -face, uh, for our next lesson. We will be having uh, those lessons here at the church uh, where we can separate ourselves a little bit and continue to observe some social distancing. Uh, as, as we uh, move into a time of recovery, uh, the recovery of, of our economy uh, as a result of the virus that uh, we've been battling. So let's pray. Gracious Lord Jesus, we thank you that you created marriage that it is a relationship that you designed and for which you gave us principles. And we pray that uh, because we are a new creation, because you have put a new desire in our hearts, that we would seek to honor and uphold marriage, to live chaste and pure lives. Not that we gain anything because of that from you, but that we can be an example uh, that we can uh, do our good works so that those around us would see them and glorify you, our Father in heaven. We thank you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.